Thank you so much, my dear friend, Warren Crates. Listen, thank you all for inviting me and asking me to share with you thoughts about the political future of Eritrea. It's my honor and my pleasure to be among esteemed colleagues who are committed to discuss and negotiate these matters. I want to offer a warm welcome to my AFAR friends, specifically as we are broadcasting live uh, around the world. I want the AFAR to know that Ahmed Youssef, Warren Crates, and I are with you, and we will stay with you as we have for the past 13 years. We have uh, pressed your cause, the AFAR cause, repeatedly before the United Nations agencies, and we will continue to do so. You have had recent and startling success in these processes. On May 9th of this year, the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Eritrea singled out the AFAR for a special chapter in his report, which has not been done before. He sustained all of the allegations of rights violations, which we proved to him. In particular, he specifically recognized that you, the Afar people, are indigenous to Eritrea. You are indigenous peoples endowed with indigenous rights. He specifically recognized that Eritrea subjected the Afar people to discrimination, harassment, arbitrary arrests, other rights violation, and that you have been persecuted, which is a crime against humanity. He specifically recognized that Eritrea has displaced the Afar indigenous communities from their traditional territories inside of Eritrea. He called on the government uh, of Eritrea to immediately end these rights violation and to respect your traditional ways of life, lands, and means of livelihood. He called on all states to arrest Eritrean officials responsible for persecuting you. He asked the international community to exert maximum pressure on the government of Eritrea to end these rights violations and to end Afar suffering at the hands of the Eritrean state. Uh, we've also worked very hard in the last year for the safety of Eritrean Afar refugees. We were able to protect some Eritrean uh, military officers who defected and refused to serve on the Tigray front. Uh, Eritrea sent a platoon uh, to capture them. We were able to uh, defeat that. We intervened repeatedly with Ethiopian officials and with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees to register and to card Eritrean Afar refugees. Refugees discovered that orders came from Addis to refuse to admit any more Eritrean refugees in the Afar region, or to card them, or to provide them with the necessaries. We discovered that Eritrea sent agents to find and kidnap refugees in the Afar refugee camps to send them to fight into uh, Tigray, and that Ethiopia cooperated with these efforts. We reported this out, and those allegations, as you can see in the Special Rapporteur's report, were sustained. Many of the families here were without food in, inside of Ethiopia. Many of the refugees were without food, shelter, or the necessaries of life. So we suggested that they cross on foot into Djibouti, which many did, first 104 families, we advocated with Djibouti officials to house them, to provide them with necessaries and to issue UNHCR cards, and we were successful at this. 
We suggested others follow, and they did. There are now 1,683 Afar refugees in Oblak, in Djibouti. They're having some problems because of the delicate balance between Afar and Issa communities inside uh, Djibouti. Some of the officials uh, in Oblak were violent, as you can see on this slide. There were some difficulties getting UNHCR cards, as you can see on the slide as well. And there were threats to move these uh, refugees to the ESA areas. We've been working on these problems for a year. We've been having some success in defeating these, uh, these sources of worry. But uh, it's a constant source of worry, and we're continuing to work on it. All right, let's talk now about uh, political futures for Eritrea. And let's begin by considering something that everybody fears. In his great novel, 1984, George Orwell imagined Room 101. Room 101 was where the worst thing in the world happened to you. Well, for me, for you, for most people in the world, the worst thing in the world is to live in a failed state. Why? Because the people you love are brutalized and disappear. Because you're surrounded by the most horrible atrocities. Because death and pain are everywhere. Because you're always afraid, totally insecure, hungry, cold, or hot. The revolutions in America in 1775 and in France in 1789 gave birth to a new method of making states resistant to failure. The revolutions introduced a novel instrument of statecraft, a written document called the Constitution. Constitution set out a framework for the stable exercise of power in states in accordance with agreements reached between the various societies in the state. How has this worked out? Well, in the 234 years since the French Revolution, 792 new constitutional systems have been created. What happened to these? 518 of these have been replaced, leaving 274. 82 of these have been suspended, leaving 192 constitutions operating in the world today. The average lifetime of these uh, 792 constitutions is not long, 17 years. Because nobody wants to live in a failed state, Constitutional scholars have devoted a lot of effort to investigating what makes constitutions resilient, what makes constitutions endure, how can we prevent states from failing. Eritrea is unique. Modern Eritrea does not have a constitution. As noted by the Special Rapporteur, President Afwerki has ruled the country for 30 years without the rule of law or any other constraints on his power. Experience since 1789 teaches that one of the first acts of all new administrations is to write a constitution. And Eritrea probably will do that when it transitions away from the Afwerki regime. What should that constitution look like? Well, because nobody wants to live in a failed state, Eritrea's constitution should be designed to last. What do we know about constitutional design to prevent state failure? Constitutions cannot survive a mass turning away from the constitution because they don't self-enforce. People have to accept them. Constitutions can't survive uh, rejection of the Constitution by powerful communities. So for communities, for the mass to remain committed to the Constitution, 
it has to give them something. If it doesn't, or if it is oppressive, people will turn away eventually. Authoritarian constitutions are as durable and last as long as democratic constitutions, but most of them are eventually susceptible to what's pictured here on this slide, a mass turning away from the regime or a revolt of the powerful with resulting state breakdown. What we know is that the most prominent cause of state breakdown in modern times is conflict between ethnic communities. Comparative constitutional law has discovered that the antidote to this problem is devolution of power to, or autonomy for, interior nations. This is not only an antidote to state-destroying nationalism, it is the antidote, the only one that works in diverse states like Eritrea. Autonomy for interior nations has produced prosperity, freedom, wealth, and a good life for many troubled societies. It's especially successful in states where Warren, Amon, and I are, like Canada and also Belgium, which are among the freest, wealthiest in the history of the world. Autocrats do not favor devolution of power. Isaias is no exception. Uh, Isaias specifically targeted Ethiopia's ethnic constitution as a dangerous, this is his words, a dangerous precedent that institutionalizes ethnicity and cannot be good for Ethiopia. It's necessary for the long-term stability of the horn, Isaias stated in an interview with Ari TV that Abby does away with the ethnic constitution. In Isaias's uh, words, ethnic federalism has to be removed. Isaias's plan is to follow the Chinese uh, model with Chinese style centralization and suppression of ethnic minorities as a political counterpoint. Uh, Say Hagos said correctly that Isaias' objective is to lead a regional alliance of autocrat uh, imposed on his dictatorial model of governance, imposed by a security apparatus and army, possibly with authoritarian dynastic intentions. Isaias has always been a centralizer a strategy he learned when training in Mao's China. He controlled the EPLF by a small clique at the center. The PFDJ is an extension of the president's office, imposing the president's control. Isaias initiated a constitution-making exercise in 1994. Isaias handpicked the chair of the Constitutional Commission, uh, Professor Selassie, an American scholar. The commission reported to the PFDJ throughout. The commission's process took place in an anti-democratic landscape that did not tolerate political dissent or engage the different national communities in interest-based negotiations. Selassie produced a highly centralized Stalinist constitution in keeping with Isaias's instructions and also consistent with the socialist Marxist spirit of the EPLF that Isaias learned in Mao's China. The 1997 constitution Selassie produced establishes a central government that is not meant to share power with the nations and nationalities of Eritrea or anyone else, quite the reverse. It allows the center to strip away autonomy and self-government from communities that have exercised this since prehistory. Ethnicity is meant to disappear. As the chair of the Constitutional Commission wrote in the 2011 book about the Constitution, the Eritrean constitution is trying by all means and policies 
to subdue and neutralize ethnic identities. Experience in 1789 teaches this model does not work in deeply diverse or multinational democracies. A generation of comparative constitutional research confirms this finding. Professor Selassie is now a dissident. He has accepted criticism of the constitution he produced. Uh, uh, particularly that it's overly centralized. He said, as we transcribed from a videotape, in retrospect, if we had the chance to rewrite it, I would consider a system in which local autonomy is guaranteed, iron guaranteed. Another problem with the 1997 constitution is that is, it does not provide protection for customary laws, including personal status, legal capacity, family law, or other matters of private law that are traditionally controlled by indigenous societies through customary practices. This is a marked change from the 1952 decentralized constitution of Eritrea, and it's unwarranted. Customary legal systems are essential to the health of indigenous and other traditional societies. Collapsing them will be particularly destructive to the pastoralists all over Eritrea, and I'll show you why in a moment. The 1997 constitution expropriates the land rights people exercised on the territory that's now Eritrea for millennia. As the special rapporteur pointed out, Eritrea has been persecuting the Afar by displacing them from their traditional lands and territories. Ahmed and I documented this in great detail for the special rapporteur and uh, other agencies. Uh, for example, or just one of many, to tell you how this works, the Eritrean army, without any warning in 2016, surrounded uh, 2,000 Afar families in the Kaluli area inside of Eritrea uh, with army trucks. Soldiers jumped out, uh, took out their guns, and at gunpoint, they forced uh, these 2,000 families from their homes and pushed them into the desert. No warning. Just go. And so people say, where do we go? You go or we'll shoot. So 2,000 families ran away on the spot into the desert. We interviewed some of them when they reached Eritrea. Many died on the way. And Eritrea then leased the land to Australian miners for potash exploitation. The 1997 constitution would authorize this theft of customary land rights. This changes property rights protected under the 1952 constitution uh, of Eritrea. Customary property rights were protected. This frankly is disgraceful and it's illegal under international law. Pastoralists, Afar, and all the other nationalities occupy 54% of Eritrea's land. Pastoralism, pastoralism is the principal economic means of subsistence of more than one third of the population of Eritrea. Now, let's just think. Are these people a burden, as Eritrea thinks? Do they need to be modernized, as Eritrea thinks? All right. Well, Eritrea is food insecure. It has a tiny GDP, about $5 billion. It's got per capita income of $58 a month, huge unemployment. It scores 186 out of 188 countries on the Human Development in, in, in Index. Okay, that's Eritrea. Now, by contrast, the pastoralists are working the land. They are working. 
They are using it, and they're using it in a productive way. They are self-sufficient in meat. They are self-sufficient in milk. Together, in Eritrea, the pastoral has owned 2.3 million cattle, 7.9 million sheep and goats, and 300,000 camels, which they breed and they sell in domestic and foreign markets. These products are a significant part of Eritrea's economy, a very significant part. Eritrea gives them virtually no sorry, what happened here? Eritrea gives them virtually no help. And, and the pastoralists could use some help to improve their access to markets, control animal health, confront widespread cattle rustling, which is endemic all over the place, ease border crossings, settle disputes, particularly in a country where firearms are ubiquitous or in an area of the country where firearms are ubiquitous. Pastoralists already produce economic surpluses, unlike most Eritreans. If, instead of displacing pastoralists from their lands, Eritrea cooperated with other countries to rationalize market access, extend extension services for animal health, train veterinarians, harmonize border policies with neighboring countries, the pastoralists could increase production and export sales and be an even larger economic contributor. The focus here should be on developing these communities, not eliminating them or settling them. They've got a life, a good one. They're a contributor and they can contribute so much more. Uh, and also the reality is we've seen all over the horn when governments displace them as it does in Eritrea or Ethiopia or Sudan, it makes worse use of the lands than before. Their grand schemes, the great things they build don't work out. We've seen this over and over again with the sugar cane sold to India. Uh, the land becomes vacant. The former economic activity that was producing surpluses, the former economic activity in the lives of thousands, it's just destroyed. The authors of the 1997 constitution did not engage with the pastoralists, not at all never thought through their place in or their contribution to Eritrean society, how to provide for their maintenance or their development, about one third of the population, and made them vulnerable to the dictate and his cronies. I have talked out with Professor Selassie many of the points and criticisms which I've just reviewed with you. And I was rewarded uh, by his agreement with me on most of the points I've discussed with you. In particular, in discussions with me, Professor Selassie agreed that the existing unitary constitution which he drafted was defective in not finding the right place for Afar and other minorities. As I said, he agreed that the Constitution needs ironclad guarantees of autonomy for the smaller nationalities, something missing from his 1997 draft. It also has no chapter on minority rights. He agrees it should have one. Other objections he agreed to had to do with guarantees for Eritrea's national languages, something mentioned by a previous speaker, indigenous lands and resources, and the place of the smaller nationalities in central institutions. These concessions were video recorded. All right. Um, given Professor Selassie's admission that the 1997 Constitution has serious defects, what does he think should happen? In his 2019 book, Focus on the Eritrean Constitution, Professor Selassie rec recommends that the 1997 Constitution be brought into effect and changed later. I believe this would be a giant mistake, and for two reasons. First, comparative constitutional law and comparative political science have studied transitions from authoritarian regimes. 
their studies are conclusive that what you get during the transition sticks. It doesn't change later by polite legal means. If the transitional deal is not well designed and stable, the new regime fails quicker, leaving a mess behind. And you can just consider the situation in Libya, Afghanistan, Sudan, let alone Eritrea in 1993. You got the you got you got the EPLF during during the transition, and you still have the EPLF today, 30 years later. The transition sticks, so. A second reason is that the 1997 Constitution, even 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 putting aside, even even thinking it could be changed later, the the amending formula in that Constitution is extremely rigid, requiring levels of agreement to change that are seldom reached anywhere. It is not going to be changed. History teaches that the moment of transition is what you get. What is decided at the moment of transition in virtually all cases will stick. Now, some people say, all right, stop talking and writing about all these fancy uh, things, constitutions and uh, what should be in them. The only solution to our problem is force. And we should put our efforts towards recruiting uh, uh, soldiers for the armed struggle to try to overthrow the dictator. And believe me, I understand and respect uh, the people, the frustration, and the people who, who, who voice these. But the reality is we fight to remove, we fight not to remove something we don't want, but we fight to replace something that we do want. If we have no vision of what we're fighting for, we'll end up in a second fight between the victors, which is a recipe for a lengthy violence leading to disaster. If you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. This is our problem now. This is the problem of people in this room. The diaspora has been unable to agree on a common vision and a common plan to get there. We are trying to solve that problem with our work here today. We have got to come together in a negotiated common vision. A highly diverse country like Eritrea must negotiate accommodations between its interior nations in order to have chances at stability and to try to inoculate the state against rapid failure. I believe that deep autonomy is the right way forward for Eritrea. The relevant principles for a new constitutional process are rule of law, democracy, equality of each nationality, nationality self-governed and autonomous regions, indigenous people's rights are respected, and also fundamental freedoms, mobility, liberty, equality are constitutionally guaranteed. Colleagues, I urge you to take ownership of this document, the AFAR Constitutional Model for Eritrea. I urge you to put your signatures on it today. I urge you to do this to unify the diaspora opposition. Give it the strength that unity will provide. Give it a chance to prevail over the dictator. Give Eritreans a chance to honor their martyrs by creating a government imbued with decency, fairness, and tolerance, and also, most importantly, a state that will not fail. I believe the FR have set out the right constitutional model for Eritrea. 
deep autonomy for all of Eritrea's nations, equality for all of her peoples, and justice for all of her societies. The 1997 Constitution, that should be considered a dead letter. It's written in the shadow of the dictator, and it will oppress many. Any attempts to implement it should be resisted. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a privilege to share my thoughts with you. I look forward to our discussion.